In the first lecture, we guessed, in, in some sense, uh, the form of the Schrodinger equation, uh, relying on a few very basic experimental facts, such as uh, wave-particle duality and uh, the dispersion relation of a free electron. But we didn't talk too much about the uh, meaning of the main object that appears in this equation, uh, the wave function, uh, which was introduced in an ad hoc fashion. So today I'm going to talk about the actual physical interpretation of quantum theory formulated this way. And we're also going to introduce um, uh, the, a few very important uh, standard notations and conventions that are going to be used uh, throughout the course and also that are routinely used in the standard literature on the subject. So here is the Schrodinger equation once again. Uh, we're going to see it very often uh, in this course. And I'm also showing here the a part of the first page of the original paper by Schrodinger, published in uh, December of 1926. And it's actually very interesting how Schrodinger came up with this work and this equation. So apparently uh, the story started back in 1925 uh, or so when he was working under Debye. And Debye uh, had just read a paper by De Broglie, where De Broglie was introducing his wave-particle duality ideas. So he got interested in these ideas and um, uh, suggested Schrodinger to give a seminar on de Broglie's work. So apparently Schrodinger actually dismissed this at first, saying that he didn't even want to think about such a silly theory. But uh, he had to give in because, well, Dubai was uh, effectively his supervisor. And so he was uh, looking into de Broglie's work, trying to present it in a more uh, mathematically sophisticated form. And in doing so, he came up with the Schrodinger equation, essentially, as we now know it, and um, uh, which brought him uh, the worldwide uh, recognition and uh, Nobel Prize in physics in 1933. So another important thing that Schrodinger uh, did was that he used his equation to solve a very important problem of a charged particle in a Coulomb potential, which essentially describes a quantum uh, hydrogen atom, and um, he found um, the energy level structure, which, is, uh, which was consistent uh, with, the, uh, with the Bohr's atom. And so actually, Charles Clark is going to talk about the, uh, this solution later in the course. Uh, but I'm going to just mention here that this was indeed very important and it was a clear smoking gun that Schrodinger was on the right track. But according to Debye, at least, uh, quite interestingly, um, uh, Schrodinger didn't really understand uh, the true meaning of his own work. He actually dismissed even the importance of it at first. So I don't know if it was just uh, Debye being jealous or uh, it was true, but certainly if you actually read uh, the original paper by Schrodinger, you don't see too much insight into the uh, true physical interpretation of his own equation. The correct interpretation of Schrodinger equation was developed uh, very shortly after Schrodinger's work by Max Born. Uh, perhaps actually I should say not uh, the correct interpretation, but the commonly accepted interpretation, because uh, uh, scientists actually have been arguing about the interpretation up to these days, uh, and uh, uh, some are still not convinced that the Born interpretation and the Born, Born rule that I'm going to present is the only correct uh, view of quantum physics. But certainly this uh, Born rule is the cornerstone of uh, a standard quantum theory and it is indeed consistent with uh, uh, all experimental data as we know it or, uh, at this stage. Now, uh, before formulating this rule, uh, I would like to make a few general comments about uh, quantum physics and uh, make, make them in contrast to classical physics. So in classical physics, if we have uh, a classical system, let's say this is a closed classical system with some cl uh, classical particles moving around, and if we know everything about this system, let's say we know uh, all the uh, coordinates of all the particles at a certain moment of time and all the velocities at a certain moment of time, then uh, classical theory predicts with absolute certainty every the result of any conceivable experiment that is going to happen in the future which is determined by let's say trajectories of particles uh, at any subsequent uh, moment of time and they in turn determine all possible outcomes of all possible experiments now this is the classical system so the truth about the quantum system so if you look at the the actual uh, situation with quantum systems so if you have a quantum system like that 
so with some wave function psi so even if we know everything possible about uh, this quantum system that is if we know psi and if we know all the forces everything about the system we still cannot possibly predict with certainty the outcomes of um, uh, well-posed experiments. Let's say if we have uh, some detectors here and they measure, uh, well, uh, let's say uh, detect electrons or some other particles. So even if we know everything about the quantum electrons, we still cannot predict for sure which detector is going to pick up uh, electrons at a certain moment of time. And so this uncertainty and um, um, is intrinsic to quantum physics, and there is no way around it. And so Warren, Warren realized it, and um, he also found a way to quantify this uncertainty uh, using the wave function. And his, um, uh, what we know now is the Born rule is uh, written here. So basically he um, uh, proposed, uh, and uh, afterwards it was confirmed, again by comparing with experimental data, that um, uh, the absolute value of the wave function evaluated at a certain position in space in a certain moment of time uh, gives the probability density of finding uh, a quantum particle described by this wave function in this uh, this position and at this moment of time t. Well, the probability itself is going to be psi absolute value of psi squared times uh, the volume, uh, the elementary volume uh, in the vicinity of a certain uh, point. This work of Max Born turned out to be extremely influential um, and groundbreaking, and he eventually received uh, um, a Nobel Prize for these ideas, in part, in 1954. As a matter of fact, he should have received this award uh, much earlier. He was nominated um, uh, by Albert Einstein, actually, back in the 30s, uh, but uh, he didn't get it due to some political reasons. Um, but in any case, this probabilistic interpretation was and actually remains uh, um, a very remarkable uh, feature of quantum physics, which also is a source of confusion oftentimes. And uh, I'm actually supposed to tell you now about um, uh, this uh, uh, probabilistic um, uh, property being um, a mystery of quantum physics and something which we will never be able to understand. But I would actually argue otherwise, that there is, in fact, nothing mysterious about it. If by mysterious we mean uh, something that is not consistent with our everyday intuition, and everyday experience, so actually uncertainty uh, um, is a part of our everyday life. Whether we are dealing with a sporting event or any other event in our life, we can predict with certainty, even if we know everything, uh, how it's going to turn out. And so um, uh, I don't see reason uh, to demand from science deterministic answers. And nature just doesn't work this way, and so we should just accept this fact and get used to it. 